So, good morning, everyone. Yo, Swires got his hands on some NATO property, and now he's bombing. He's, now he's dropping hacker spaces and not bombs. So, please welcome. Good morning, Shah. I'm here to talk about the Beehive Tech Campus, and uh, in order to really talk about this, we have to talk a bit about the narrative. We are here at a hacker camp, and a hacker camp is an excellent place to share ideas and uh, really talk about stuff and come up with new ideas because you hear about older ideas. I mean, if you look at, at former hacker camps, like, well, uh, you, you see the lines here, um, companies spawned out of that, ideas spawned out of that, uh, tools that uh, better the world and society as a whole. And, which is awesome. So we have to keep on doing this. But if you look at the what the heck and, and, and the hacking at large, OM last year, SHA, and even if you count the international ones, the CCC, uh, the stuff in England, and the, um, the Fred Fest in, uh, in, in, in Vegas, um, you still come up with, well, a, a week, a year, maybe? Because some of these things are once every four years, like this one. I mean, it's awesome, but it doesn't happen that often. Which means that by communication in this matter, where our efficiency is close to 2%, right? If we could be doing this non-stop, just imagine what kind of ideas and new initiative could spawn out of this hive mind of minds. That would be brilliant. But we as a hacker, hacker community, we're only at a 2% efficiency if we look at these kind of communications. That's weird. Well, you might say we have stuff for that, like hackerspaces, because they don't exist only 2% of the time. True. I mean, hackerspaces are a very good place to share ideas, not unlike uh, uh, the stuff we are doing here today. But then again, yes, there's lectures during the day. You can do that in a hackerspace. And you can have drinks. That tends to happen here as well. You can do that in a hackerspace. And some hackerspaces, you can even sleep and actually, well, live for a bit. But it's not catered to actually be living on premises. And uh, as you might have noticed, because uh, you're here a couple of days already, a lot of the actual ideas happen over drinks, right? So it's not just looking at some dude on a stage saying, uh, explaining his idea, actually having meaningful conversations later, so unscheduled stuff, that, that's brilliant. So doing what you want to do, but sharing with others is probably better offline. Hackerspaces. I'm a member of um, Hack42, which is an Arnhem. That's a crappy picture. Well, <clears throat> we used to um, uh, have our facility in a uh, ex-NATO base. Um, with, uh, we were blurred on Google Earth and everything. Uh, now we moved to this property. Next door, there's a church we can use that we even used for uh, hacker weddings. And this is a very functional hackerspace. And it's, just, it's not just technology. Uh, we, we talk about all the things that are uh, interesting in the hacker community. So it works. It works perfectly. But it's not a hacker camp. Because, yes, we get guests every so often. And we have, but, but, but it's not as this. It's not the international world coming in f full time. So how to mitigate that? I have a dream. My dream is to buy this piece of property. Yes. This is an actual Panopticon prison. It's designed, well, to house criminals, of course. That's what you do in a Panopticon. It's designed in 1800 something, in the time that drawings were still made with pen on paper. It, the idea is that you make a round building with a huge open space in the middle and put a guard in the middle. And that guard can, can be watching you 24-7. So 
So it's not unlike uh, today's society, where you're totally watched online. And what happens if you perceive that you could be watched 24-7, you start to behave better. And better in this, uh, in this situation means that you're not behaving badly, because people might be watching you. But that also means that you become less creative. Because normally, if you're in your own thought process or in your own lab, doing stuff, experimenting, you will be doing dumb shit. And that's good, because if you fail often enough, at some point you will go like, whoa, this actually works. But before you have the actual idea that that works, and that you'll be willing to spread out, uh, to, 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 to share with the world, you have to be able to fail and have ideas that you keep private. If somebody could be watching every step of your thought process or, or your design process or your process, whatever, you become less creative. Because uh, once there was a guy that said, um, uh, he was a guitarist, and he said, when I'm on stage and I do something really stupid that happens to sound brilliant, that took months to figure out how to actually do that really new weird stuff on, on your strings. And within that process, he's been doing that weird stuff, but it sounded awful, right? And only after those months doing weird stuff, it sounded cool enough to actually share with the world. The steps before were not meant to be shared. So constantly watching people is a bad thing. That, that makes it less creative. And so a panopticon prison is a bad thing, I think. And well, actually, if you are a prisoner, your main thought process, I can imagine, is to get out of there, which it's an, it's an escape room, basically. And um, it is. Well, actually, uh, we'll, we'll get to that. So giving prisoners the perception that they're constantly was, watched will make them less creative and thus less likely to escape prison. So the thought process for a prison makes sense, but for society it shouldn't be. Okay, so we're going to use this evil thing to do good. And it's not just this building, it's a whole facility. Yeah, we like to think big. And because it's rather old, it has some peculiar building style. This is the actual front gate. I think it looks awesome. Um, but the main uh, structure, so the dome itself, is huge. It has four layers. Every layer consists of 50 cells, which are tiny, because they're prisons. And it's a huge open space in the middle. This is the map of the complete facility. And I'll show a different map, which only outlines the actual buildings. Now, the round middle thing is the dome. This is the, the entrance, where you saw the, uh, the, the castle uh, doors, basically. Um, this part at the bottom is newer. And we're planning, uh, so that's offices at the moment, and that's what we're going to use it for as well. Because you can imagine this will cost a bundle of money, not just to buy, but also to upkeep. So we need to have a, uh, a stream of cash coming in. So we will be giving tech companies, well, companies, but most of it will probably be tech. Uh, so companies we like that uh, share our thoughts, uh, our sh thoughts and ideas will uh, we'll house there for a fee, of course. Um, this is a, also a newer building, which is a bigger open space. We're planning to host a, uh, a hosting facility there. Um, and of course, we're going to call it high secure hosting because it's in a prison. So that's going to happen. Um, and the building, the tiny building up, up, uh, up top, that's also a newer building. And that we're going to change into uh, a bit more lux luxurious housing for uh, people come over and uh, don't want to have those cramped spaces. So it is either VIPs of people who actually fork over a lot of cash. So yes, 
We will be talking about cash. Um, I know we are a sharing economy and we want everybody to do, to, to get what they need without, and everybody should pay the same. Yeah, sure, that's a brilliant idea, but then this will probably not happen because this needs an investment. Um, what will we be doing in this facility? Well, we have room for 200 hackers. So that's a tiny village. And they will doing hacky stuff. I mean, two years ago, or a year ago, I don't know when you first heard that there would be a hacker camp here now, you didn't know what was going to happen. It's just a couple of thousand nerds in tents doing cool stuff. That was about all you knew at that time. And that it probably would be awesome, right? You didn't know the amount of tents and what the actual lectures would be about. And you had a vague idea of what would happen because it happened before. Well, this is comparable. So if you actually want to know what we're going to do here, well, you have to wait a bit. Because <laughs> we don't know. We're going to do awesome stuff. Yeah, yes, there will be uh, so, 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 some housing, and yes, there will be living quarters, and there will be lectures. But that's about it. More of what we're actually going to do is up, the, up to the community. And like I said, we have 200 rooms that people can live in, and the idea is to make it fluid. So you will not be able to probably not be able to buy a cell and start actually living there. The idea is to rent it for a set amount of time. Um, so you want to do a project for, let's say, two months, so you live there for two months. You don't have to, but that would be the optimum. And um, we'll, we'll get into the, uh, the, the money structure later, because it's not just for wealthy hackers. That's definitely not the idea. But some revenue has to be in there. So this is the main hall. It's huge. And to give you an idea of scale, uh, in that open space, you can fit other buildings, like this one. This is the actual White House. I, according to Wikipedia, this fits in our open space, and you can still walk around it. If you're not into weird political structures, this also fits two blue wheels back to back. And then you can walk around it. And if you take a space shuttle and put it on his nose or on his tail, whatever, then it, uh, you're a couple of feet short. So that's about the height of the... Well, if you take the nose cone off, which you want to have next to it anyway, so that, 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 then it does fit. So it's a huge space that we can use. It's a huge open space. So imagine what you can do with that. I mean, there's rails across the, 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 the balconies, so you can make a huge 3D printer out of that thing. You can, there's room for that. And uh, so it's going to be a creative stuff. And what's going to happen is actually up to the guys living there, the guys doing their stuff there. Of course, there will be some structure. I mean, we're currently with five guys uh, who have thought this up, and we're trying to make this happen. And we're basically facilitating a space where awesomeness might spawn, not unlike a hacker camp, except, well, we have roofs and other facilities. And, but these are just five guys. Uh, some of them have a hacker background. Some of them know how to actually deal with buildings. Uh, and so, so it's, it's a group that, uh, with different backgrounds that hopefully can manage this. And uh, to heighten those chances that th this will actually happen, of course, some adult supervision is required. So we, uh, we started, no, we asked some guys to join our uh, advisory board. So actual grown-ups who uh, might, uh, who will look at our ideas and tell us if they're stupid or could be better. Uh, as for now, uh, one of our members is Bart Jacobs. He's a IT professor in, uh, in the Nijmegen. He has an awesome network and he's a cool guy. On Sylvain de Leest, uh, also for network and the link to our hacker community. Jay Abelou, he's a CIO from KPN. 
Um, so also some, she basically to show that we will have a tie-in with actual companies. And um, yes, she's part of a big company. And, but if you know her, her mindset is basically that of ours. She is a hacker. And one of our latest additions to that group is Peter Milenar. Uh, there's no picture of him online available as far as I could see. We're working on that. And uh, his experience at the moment is very good at lobbying at different parts of the world to get funding and ideas to come to life. That group will grow. That group will grow because we, we need more people to actually uh, help us with ideas and what, what else to do. Timeline. So what is actually happening at the moment? Um, about two years ago, give or take, um, the prison that we're talking about was an actual prison. Uh, actually, that was three years ago. Um, yeah, well, at some point it was still a functional prison. And for some reason, the Netherlands lacks prisoners. And so they decided to close that down. And then we have a facility with a lot of, lot of rooms. And then in the world, stuff happens. So we got refugees. And some people thought it would be a bright idea to house refugees in this facility. And that actually turned out to be a good idea. Uh, but PR-wise, putting refugees in prison, it doesn't sound right. So after some point, they decided to relocate those guys, because most of them are guys, and uh, to actually close the prison again, which turned out uh, that the, uh, the people living there, not, not in there, but in the surroundings, so the neighbors basically, they started to like their refugees. Because uh, th this subset of refugees, they were kept busy and they integrated with the community and they were really part of that community. So there came protests from the community because they wanted to close this, this prison and get, uh, and get the refugees relocated. That protest was successful and uh, the facility remained open housing refugees for more than a year longer than was anticipated. So having the local community on board apparently has pull. And we noticed that. So that's what we're doing. So we are in contact uh, with the local uh, municipality and also with the community there to figure out what they are, their ideas are and how uh, that influences ours. So what I'm explaining is basically lobbying. We are explaining what we're going to do and because, well, we call it a tech campus, but it is a hacker campus. And hackers, well, you guys know that a hacker is not an evil world, an evil word, but explaining that to the outside world takes some effort every now and then. And, but doing that in a meaningful manner and very slowly will, will spawn that, uh, will, will give that idea to the outside world that we're actually doing good stuff, because I do think we are. So timeline, at the moment we're lobbying on several levels, so we're talking to the municipality, and, um, but also to, uh, to the government, because this building is owned by uh, the Netherlands, the, the government, so, so no local level, and um, they want to get rid of it. And of course, the department who has to get rid of housing only has one mission, fork in as much money as, as, as humanly possible, because that's the idea. At the moment, um, real estate in the Netherlands, uh, if you want to do something with a building, you have to have a permit, right? That's the way it works. And the local permit states that if I now buy this prison, the only thing I can do with this is start a prison. Because that's what's, that's what's in the permit. And actually at this point it's housing a uh, escape room, which is kind of ish within limits of that permit, I reckon. Um, but if I got to buy it, I can do absolutely nothing with it without a change of that permit. So what is happening now that the, uh, the government who owns the building wants that permit to be as wide as possible because that will raise the price 
if I'm allowed to tear down this building, put high rise in there and sell apartments, then it's quite easy to make a buck. And therefore, it's also quite easy to place a huge bid on that property. If I'm not allowed to, to do anything with it, then of course nobody would want it and the, the, the money they will get for this building would be quite low. So the government wants the permit to be as wide as possible, but the municipality, so the local government, wants it to be less big. Because, well, it's um, the, the part of town where, because this is dead smack in the middle of town, but the part of town where this facility is, is a quite quiet uh, uh, part of town, and they don't want to have a gazillion people there. So turning it into an amusement park will not fly well with the local uh, municipality. So that will probably be not be on the permit. But what will be, that's basically, it's not fighting, they're, they're negotiating at the moment what can actually happen. So what they did a couple of months ago, they started a public inquiry, uh, a market inquiry, so to figure out what people like us would want to do with this building, to figure out how wide the, uh, the permit had to be uh, uh, widened to actually make a sale uh, feasible for a good price. Um, at that point, there were 11 parties interesting in uh, acquiring this piece of property, and they had to submit their plans. So what are you going to do? How are you going to fund that? And uh, we're not talking about numbers yet, but they need to have an idea that it's feasible what uh, the parties are doing, and if there would be an actual party, to uh, an actual serious party to, to an, uh, endeavor this, uh, this idea. That resulted in a very expensive report, of course, because reports should be expensive, otherwise they don't exist. And in the end, there are five parties left who are interested in this facility. So we lost six competitors and four down to go. That's what we're doing at the moment. And of course, we're not waiting for the property to do cool stuff. We're here as well, and we do cool stuff. So, and like I said, I'm a member of Hackerspace Hackforce too, and we have a church, which is also not tiny. So we use that church to uh, give lectures, because uh, it can house quite a lot of people, and to spread the word that we're going to do this beehive thing. One of the lectures we did was by Bill Binney. Uh, he also gave a keynote here. And uh, yeah, th th that was a good name to get some people in that are not just from the hacker community. And that was excellent. Uh, he was talking about, well, NSA surveillance and uh, how they shouldn't do it, how they do it, and how they fuck up. And after that, we had a talk by Mitch Oldman. Um, he's also uh, uh, current, uh, currently at the camp. And he gave a talk about um, Silicon Valley and why Silicon Valley is as successful as Silicon Valley is sometimes and why carbon copies that are tried to be made out of Silicon Valley because other parts of the world also want a Silicon Valley, why they fail. And uh, that was excellent. So it was exactly what we needed to spread the word. And Besides that, uh, like I said, we want to have a local reach. So at some point, we uh, sent a letter out to a uh, local community and uh, inviting them for a workshop to enhance your digital security. So normal people, not IT uh, folks. And it's still, I mean, you get invited to a hacker group that's going to tingle with your laptop. So we teamed up with local police so the police was inviting people in to secure their laptop, which was awesome. And that was actually gave us a, an excellent outreach to the uh, to, to people living in the neighborhood, because now they go like, we like those hackers. Those hackers are cool. So having us as neighbors might be not such a bad thing. And one of the other uh, uh, activities we did with, uh, uh, with Ancilla van der Leest. She gave a workshop uh, uh, targeted to young girls uh, between the age 12 and 17, I think, to uh, 
to fight online harassment and how to digital uh, defend yourself on that. Social capital, I was talking about that. Um, like I said, uh, we want those cells to be rented out. And rent means that there's a price. Some people will not be able to afford that price. Um, that price can be paid in many ways. So if you can't afford it money-wise, um, if you contribute it, if you contribute enough to the community in, in there, that price will go down. So if you just look at it as, oh, it's cheap housing, your rent will go up. If you think it's a cool idea and I can really share my ideas there, your rent will probably go down. That also goes for communities as well. And uh, we want to make it local and keep it local. Um, by that I mean we're not going to source a cleaning company from the next state, but that's going to be local. Um, we can do that. One of our partners uh, did a project, it's not completely related to this, but turning a huge fucking building into a housing thing and make some uh, living quarters out of it. Uh, they did that in Utrecht and they actually got a social involvement award uh, for that project. So we should be able to mimic at least that and make it an awesome place to live in. And that's basically what I have to say about this. I expect there to be quite a lot of questions. And if that's the case, please line up. And if there's any interest, please leave a note at these things. And we have a Twitter and a Facebook account. So for that, that is this. And I'll be taking questions now. Thank you. Yes. Uh, this is more of a comment than a question. Did you consider school for uh, programmers, uh, technologists, school of the modern renaissance, specifically dedicated for people uh, in underprivileged minorities, potentially refugees, people with low education, so Absolutely. you could teach them? The, uh, I mean, like I said, uh, we already did two workshops teaching how to digitally defend yourself. And uh, we're looking at the local, uh, the, the local community to actually step in. And like I said, uh, there has been living refugees there for quite some time. So getting them in again to help out and to do stuff and maybe do a course or so, uh, that's, that's definitely on our radar. Uh, second question. Second question is about the branding, because the building, it is a, the best example of Panopticon. Yes. Did you consider naming yourself Panopticon? Uh, yes, we did consider that, but at, uh, in the Netherlands there are three buildings that are identical, so we have three prisons. And one of them, the one in Breda, the, the foundation that is taking care of that, uh, is called the Panopticon. So that would be weird. <laughs> And because of the shape and the buzzing activities that we want to do there, uh, I think Beehive uh, kind of does the trick as well. But uh, yeah, we did consider that. And um, these are some aerial pictures that we found online because it's still a prison. And of course, you can't fly a drone there. So we didn't. OK. Um, I was at OM 2013. And there was a workshop on hacker bases by uh, David from uh, Cyber Hippie Totalism. Yep. And um, one of the persons in the audience was, well, I'm from Hack42, and we don't allow people to sleep over there because blah de blah de blah What yes. did you make your change your mind? Uh, um, I'm a member of Hack42. I am not Hack42. So this is, uh, this is a project that sprawled out of Hack42. Um, but it's not Hack42 going big. It's uh, one of the buildings in here. Uh, well, th th there's one building that will be uh, basically, by the looks of it now, Hack42 will move into this facility. It will not be a Hack42 facility. It will be a facility that houses Hack42. Hack42 will be one of our first renters uh, for a good price. And it will do its hackery thing. Hack42 will not change, it will just move. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So, so probably within Hack42 you still can't sleep, but the huge big fucking 
building next to it, you can. Okay, they're totally separate. Uh, well, not totally, not but uh, 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 legally, they're yeah, they're, they're two legal the entities, yes. The one in the back. Um, so, how are you funding the initial uh, buyout, and uh, how are you, um, what's the financial model, what's the, um, how, how are you going to maintain that? How the hell are you going to pay this? That's, yeah, basically. that's basically the question, yeah. Um, and who's going to own it afterwards? <laughs> uh, we, we've been, we, of course, we've been thinking about this and thinking about this hard. As it's a community thing, uh, uh, crowdsourcing sounds like a uh, ideal match, except these kind of numbers, because we are talking about really big numbers, are quite hard to actually crowdsource. So we are looking at uh, funding in alternative ways. And yes, I'm quite vague on that. I, uh, I, I do uh, agree. Uh, so w we're working on it. Let's put it like that. Um, one, of the, one of the pitfalls you can have, suppose Facebook comes on and thinks this is a brilliant idea. And they decide to fork over 20 million. Uh, we really should say no to that offer because um, then it would be a Facebook thing. And if it's a cool project funded by Facebook, I'm pretty sure I'm losing quite a substantial part of my uh, uh, hacker, hacker groups that I need to actually get in. So am I against funding by Facebook? Not necessarily me as a person, but if they fund the whole thing, then yes. And if they, so I would not want them as an angel investor, or as a substantial investor, uh, if we have this up and running for a couple of years and they come on and we want to give you guys shirts, I'd probably say, okay, does that give an idea of what we're going? So are you planning at least like a majority share to stay with you or? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay. We want to buy the property, one, we, wanna, we, we're not, we don't want to rent the property as, as a foundation, we want to buy it so it's ours, so we can make actual decisions. Because okay. if you get money by, uh, suppose you work on funding by, for example, Facebook, at some point we will do something that will, that will, make, that will cross them. I mean, there, there's definitely that possibility. So them pulling funding would be a bad thing. So we don't want any revenue in that can stop at any given point because we do stuff. Yes, thank you. In the front. Yeah. Um, very interesting. Uh, small questions. Um, looking at the model itself, it seems very similar to artists in residence. Uh, have you considered to review the current model of artists and residence artists? Uh, I think in Netherlands they have many of them, in Europe too. Um, they have way of funding too. Um, would you join such kind of project or is it completely separated or artists are too it's different than hackers? We, at Hack42, we already had a artist in residence, so we know the concept. And it's, uh, bits and pieces of it is definitely comparable. So if we find, I don't know, a very interesting hacker project doing something in Brazil, uh, yes, there, there should be funding to fly him over and to house him and do his stuff. So it basically, it, it's, it's a pay-as-you-can thing. And, uh, but we decide if you can or not. And so, yes, uh, artists in residence, hackers in residence, uh, it, it's, yeah, it, w we're taking bits and pieces from other ideas. So if, if you say it's comparable to, I can't disagree on that. Yes, it's, uh, thank you. Hi. Oops. You're good. Hi. Uh, by the way, it's an amazing idea. Uh, I had one question about the funding, but you ended up answering. So my other question is, do you believe this will, be, will resist to the zombie apocalypse? Uh, depends what causes the apocalypse. But okay. uh, uh, I'm pretty sure we can keep R the zombies out. Awesome. And uh, uh, we're, we're, we're trying to, well, if we buy it, uh, in the end, we want it to be as sustainable as possible. Uh, so we want to uh, create our own energy but off the bat, that will not happen, because that takes a huge investment. Uh, but in time, it will become greener and greener, let's put it like that. And uh, the buildings are awesome. 
Uh, oh, the, 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 the walls are awesome and that will definitely take something out. And unlike this field, this is above sea level, so we're good. <laughs> <laughs> For now. <laughs> For, well, yeah. <laughs> the back. Really interesting talk. So uh, my question is another funding question. Yep. So um, there was this. Uh, so there was a blockchain talk before your talk. There and, was what? Uh, there was a blockchain, blockchain talk. Yes. Yeah. So uh, in the Ethereum Foundation, there was uh, this uh, kind of a decentralized organization that they created, where for funding, perhaps, have you considered like uh, doing um, a crowdfunding campaign based on a cryptocurrency? And uh, the if people who like invest have a like a shareholder decision. Yeah, if, that, if that, I, I want to avoid the joke. Like, make an ICO. Why not? If we're gonna do a uh, a money drive and get money in, I frankly do not care in which currency you pay me. If, yeah. you, <laughs> if you throw gold bullion over the fence, I'm good with that. If you wanna. Uh, if, if you want to give me uh, Bitcoin, sure. But we will not be handing out pieces of the pie of influence in the, in the structure. Yeah, that so, was so, so there will be no buy-in. Uh, I want a 20% share, here it is. You're allowed to, sh to pay a 20% share, but that will not give you 20% influence. Great, that was the uh, okay. thing I wanted. Hi, you're, you're very insistent on wanting to buy the property. That's correct. Um, have you considered doing some other uh, uh, construction? For example, friends of mine do something on one of the old Dutch uh, waterline fortresses, and they have the construction that Staatsbos here is still the one who owns the property, yep. uh, but they have an uh, Erfpacht construction. Okay. Um, and that means that Staatsbos is also uh, continuing to be investing in, in yep. well things there. Maybe the uh, 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 I think this is Rijksgebouwendienst. Maybe this they're interested in, in making that combination. You don't they're need not. to do everything yourself. There. They're not. Yeah, that, that's uh, we, we did. Uh, I personally think the best idea is to actually buy it because then you have a say of what you can do with it. Uh, this is a monument, so uh, you're still bound by quite a lot of laws what you can actually do with the property. Uh, it's not a complete property as a monument, so... Uh, and upkeeping a monument to spec takes a lot of money. Uh, but actually, it's not, my, it's not my decision per se, because Rijksgebouwendienst, the actual owner at the moment, wants to get rid of it. They don't want to rent it out. Uh, so that option is basically off the table. And... Uh, yeah, so we can't even choose it, even if we, w if we wanted to at the moment. Are there more questions? We have two mics open. That's it? Oh, there's one. Hi, Jos. Thank Bye. you for your talk. Uh, we've met earlier. Maybe you remember. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you showed us a picture of Jaya Baloo. Um, yes. Actually, I'm working at KPN now, yep. um, where I work um, um, at the security services department of KPN, mm -hmm. and I'm responsible for um, strategy execution there. Um, how can we, um, or other big companies, apart from fundraising, funding this, this idea, help, help you with making this a reality? Well, KPN is an excellent example of a big company that is slowly starts to listen to hackers, to the hacker community, and is doing an excellent job in that. And uh, so spreading that idea, spreading that mindset, and also uh, spreading that a hacker camp like this is awesome, but that has to happen more. So embrace your hacker and do that there. That would be an excellent idea. So making it known that this initiative exists and work with it, and maybe get an office there, I don't know. So if you want a, a, a remote office there or have it as a shared working space and just say up front, yes, we want X working spaces there for that amount of time and we will be paying that amount. That will quite seriously help us in our funding efforts because then we can go to people who will supply the money and we say, well, we have these renters already lined up. So you see, it's a viable plan. So that, that would be a helpful thing. Thank you. 
More questions? Still two open mics. So I guess we're done then. Okay. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>